In the early 1970s, still reeling from the embarrassing loss to the United States of having landed the first men on the moon, the Soviet Union remained undeterred. So much so that within two years of the first moon landing, the USSR set off on a string of record firsts in space that would take years for others to break. However, sadly, one of those records was a very grim, an unfortunate record that has never been achieved before or since. Nevertheless, all those records first were set by the cosmonauts you are watching right now during their records stay on the world's very first space station, the Soviet Soyuz 1. In June of 1971, the crew you see exercising in the weightlessness of space to keep their mortal vessels healthy to withstand the harsh rigors of the void of space are Georgi Dubrovsky, Commander, Vladislav Volkov, Flight Engineer, and Viktor Pasayev, Research Engineer. However, little did these men know at the time that all their attention to their healthy bodies would be for naught, because in a matter of hours from recording this film, one of the many first space achievements I was telling you about, well, one of those achievements would be that these men would be the first and only humans ever to die in the vacuum of space. And these men simply did not escape the surly bonds of Earth and peacefully slept into that good night. Because you see, their end was not a dream, but an actual nightmare. Their end was an agonizing fate so gruesome that the history books and science fiction films rarely talk about it. So don't you believe it when they tell you in the movies that in space, nobody can hear you scream. Because indeed, yes, they can hear you scream. Dabrowski, Volkov, and Patsayev arrived at the world's first Earth-orbiting space station on June 7, 1971, when their record 23 days in orbit began. During their time aboard Salyut, the world's first orbiting space station, among some of their first record-breaking events, they were the first humans to successfully inhabit a space station. They set a new space endurance record for the longest time spent in space. They conducted various experiments in astrophysics and biology. They were also the first people to vote from space during Soviet elections. Also, they recorded spectrograms of stars using the Orion 1 ultraviolet telescope, with Patsayev becoming the first person to operate a telescope outside of Earth's atmosphere. And as you can plainly see, they spent a lot of time studying the effects of long-term weightlessness on the human body testing equipment like the Vetter device, later known as Chibis, to study the cardiovascular system's response to weightlessness. And indeed, they would personally experience the harshest effect that space could have on the human body. After completing their record-breaking 23-day stay in space, it was time to board their Soyuz capsule and head for home. In the early hours of 30 June 1971, the Soviet Union prepared to welcome its three latest cosmonaut heroes back to Earth. As the commander of one of the recovery helicopters spotted the parachute of Soyuz 11's descent module appear in the early morning moonlit sky, it was a glorious sight. The helicopters touched down and the would-be rescuers made their way cheerfully to the spacecraft that so gracefully came to rest in the Soviet desert looking no worse for wear and still superheated and charred from re-entry. However, the rescue team could not have anticipated the horror that they would find inside. 
So use 11's touchdown was wholly automatic from the parachute deployment to the firing of the solid fuel soft landing rockets in the base of the descent module. The three cosmonauts had broken the previous space endurance record of 18 days set by another Soyuz crew in 1970 and had almost doubled the U.S. Gemini 7 record. And for three weeks, Russia had been abuzz with the names of Dabrowski, Volkov, and Patsayev. The men had their own slot on Moscow television. Young girls had turned Volkov into a teen idol and pinup star and their landing was accompanied by a carnival-type atmosphere. However, miles away at their offices, as time went on, Nikolai Kaminin, the commander of the cosmonaut team and veteran cosmonaut Alexei Leslev, waited more than an hour for news of a successful recovery. Then the men wondered what could be taking so long. After they had just received the report that Soyuz 11 performed a picture-perfect touchdown, then suddenly the tense silence back at the headquarters was shattered by a voice over the radio, uttering three simple numbers. All the message said was one, one, one. The seasoned cosmonaut commanders knew exactly what that meant. The worst of all possible news. The Soviets had a numeric system they used to covertly deliver news about the health of cosmonauts after each mission. It was a five-number system that ran from five to one. Five meant that they were in good condition. Four meant that they had suffered some injuries. Three meant the injuries were of a severe nature. Two meant the injuries were life and death. And finally, the number one, well, the number one meant the injuries were fatal. So the 111 message sent back to the bosses represented one number for each member of the crew killed, so the triple one meant all three were dead. From the outside, there was no damage to the capsule visible whatsoever. Still, they knocked on the side, but there was no response from within. On opening the hatch, they found all three men in their couches, motionless, with dark blue patches on their faces, and trails of blood from their noses and ears. They removed them from the descent module. The Brofsky was still warm. The doctors gave him artificial respiration. Based on their reports, the hasty initial cause of death was suffocation. However, it would be determined in a subsequent investigation that an air vent had been jerked open during the separation of the orbital and descent modules, and that all three men had been dead for over a half an hour. Moreover, at least 11 minutes of this time they had been very alive and writhing in extreme pain while exposed to the vacuum of space. Humans and experimental animals had sometimes suffered rapid decompression in terrestrial laboratories or on scientific balloons at high altitude. But the Soyuz 11 crew were the first humans to suffer the vacuum of space at an altitude in excess of 100 kilometers. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation is only likely to be effective if given within six minutes of the cessation of the heart, since after this the brain is permanently damaged. The rescuers stood no chance of reviving the cosmonauts. Autopsies of all three men found they had died of hemorrhages in the brain, subcutaneous bleeding, damaged eardrums, and bleeding in the middle ear. Nitrogen was absent from the blood. It, together with oxygen and carbon dioxide, had boiled and reached the heart and brain in the form of bubbles. The formation of gas in the blood was a symptom of rapid decompression. The blood of all three men contained enormous amounts of lactic acid, fully ten times the norm, which was an indication of a terrible physical and emotional stress due to anoxia or the loss of oxygen to the body. But one of the bitterest ironies is that if the men had been provided with spacesuits, they would have survived. So why didn't they have spacesuits? Well, the ship was small. They had limited space. 
The Soyuz 7K OKS descent module used for the Soyuz 11 mission was designed to accommodate three cosmonauts. However, fitting three cosmonauts wearing bulky pressure suits within the cramped confines of the module was deemed impossible. So the decision not to wear pressure suits was a calculated risk taken by the Soviet space program to allow for a three-person crew. This was a similar approach to how early space shuttle crews flew without suits until the Challenger accident. Based on data from the onboard memory device, the orbital and instrument module separated at an altitude of around 80 miles and lasted just 0.06 seconds. The pressure in the descent module began to fall rapidly at that moment. At 1.47.26 a.m., two seconds Prior to jettisoning the orbitable module, the pressure in the descent module was 950 millimeters of mercury, which was normal. But 115 seconds later, the pressure had dropped to 50 millimeters and was still fading. In effect, there was no longer any air in the cabin. Decompression could have been caused by either a premature opening of one of the two valves at the top of the descent module or a leak from the hatch. The positions of the bodies in the descent module suggested that the Borowski and Patsayev were well aware they were dying, and both had physically tried to unstrap in order to close the valve, but had been unable to act quickly enough. At the instant of separation of the orbital and instrument modules, the cosmonauts' pulse rates varied broadly. From 78 to 85 in Dabrowski's case, to 92 to 106 for Petsayev, and 120 for Volkov. A few seconds later, when they first became aware of the leak, their pulse rate shot up dramatically to 114 and 180, and thereafter they had very little time left. 50 seconds after separation of the two modules, Petsayev's pulse had dropped to 42, indicative of someone suffering oxygen starvation. And by 110 seconds, all three men's hearts had stopped beating. Still, it would be a blessing to suppose that their deaths, though mercifully rapid, were also painless. But high altitude decompression and exposure to the vacuum of space does not produce painless results. The official autopsies remain classified to this day, as do several other documents pertaining to the disaster. But a number of conclusions have been made. The Borowski, Volkov, and Batsayev would have first experienced strong pains in their heads, chests, and abdomens, after which their eardrums would have burst and blood would have begun streaming from their noses and mouths. Due to outgassing of oxygen from the venous blood supply to the lungs, the men would have remained conscious for 50 to 60 seconds. However, they could have moved around and tried to remedy their plight only during about the first 13 seconds or so, this being the time of useful consciousness corresponding to the time that it took for the oxygen-deprived blood to pass from the lungs to the brain. The Borowski and Pasayev were best positioned to reach up and try and close the valve, but could not be certain as to the source of the leak Plus, they only had a matter of seconds to find it. And then there's this. In testing after the disaster on the ground, Alexei Leonov tried manually closing just one of the valves, and it took an astonishingly long 52 seconds. Eventually, the USSR made amends for their mistakes and never suffered a similar event again, nor has any other human died in such a manner in space. So understanding that true story, it begs the question, how long can you survive in the vacuum of space without help, or are you simply doomed? Well, as a matter of fact, animal experiments and human accidents have shown that people can likely survive exposure to vacuum conditions for at least a couple of minutes. Not that you would remain conscious long enough to rescue yourself, but if your predicament was accidental, there could be time for a fellow crew member to rescue and repressurize you with few ill effects. While the effects on animals are as gruesome as you can imagine, and we won't go into them here, some dogs managed to survive, and chimpanzees fared even better. However, neither experiment was pleasant for the technicians or the animals. However, there is one documented human example. In 1965, a technician inside a vacuum chamber at Johnson Space Center in Houston 
accidentally depressurized his spacesuit by disrupting a hose. After 12 to 15 seconds, he lost consciousness. He regained it at 27 seconds after his suit was repressurized to about half of sea level. The man reported that his last memory before blacking out was of moisture on his tongue that began to boil, as well as the loss of taste sensation that lingered for days following the accident. But he was otherwise unharmed. So I guess you could say, the whole episode just left a bad taste in his mouth. Well, that's going to do it for now. If you enjoyed this content or similar content, please be sure to leave a like and consider subscribing.